consumer dialogues. I'm Kukuletu Mfupi. Well, despite widespread unemployment, many employers are struggling to recruit people with the accounting skills that they need to grow their businesses and enable the economy to recover. As businesses becomes, or rather business becomes more complex, there is increasing demand for the most talented individuals. However, far too many people are being left behind without the skills that they need to gain a rewarding and sustainable career. Well, on this episode of SEMA Dialogues, we'll be taking a look at talent management and the employability crisis. In studio with me to help unpack this further for us, I have Professor Anton Root. He's from Wits Business School, Tess Marshall, MD of Network Recruitment, and Bright Amisi, Group Finance Manager at SABS. And we're also joined in studio by our lovely audience who will be joining us today in our Q&A session. A very warm welcome to you all and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Perhaps let's start with the picture of uh, this employment crisis in South Africa when it comes to management accountants. Uh, Tess, maybe from your perspective, is it as dreary as we make it out to be? Well, South Africa is facing a very paradoxical situation with this employability crisis. We have a 25% unemployment rate at least. Mm -hmm. But that which the workforce is supplying to the market is not that which the market is demanding. About 7% of South Africa are degree level qualified people. And about seven of that 7%, 95% are employed mm. and contribute about 65% to the GDP. Um, on the other hand, 45% of matrics are unemployed. So clearly, it, be it begins to emerge that obtaining a degree is critical to be employable. But it's also not enough, and that's something that we hear about every day when we read about the stats from Stats SA as well as uh, employment in South Africa as a whole. Sure. Prof, I want to come to you for a moment. Excuse me, I had to uh, swallow there. But uh, you deal with acad ac academics and you have a speciality from an academic background. The disconnect that you see, does it start from an educational perspective? I think the educational system process history, own understanding of what the purpose of business education is, all of these factors do play a, a very key role in producing the output of the graduates that typically uh, a business school would produce. Mm. But I just wonder whether I can't just make this observation. Uh, the word crisis is a mighty big word. Mm. Um, and I think virtually everybody would agree that there's some disconnect, uh, there's a gap between the output and what is required. But I just wonder whether we shouldn't also reflect, what is it that the students want? Mm. This is reshaping business education immensely. It's not just what the employers want, it's what do the students want? What are their expectations of a career path once they leave their education, their, their university, their business school. Before we come to someone who was a, once a student before holding the position that they have, which is bright, from your experience when you speak to them, are you finding that expectations aren't matching the reality out there? I think there's a new reality that is in the process of being shaped. And these students are deeply immersed in it. If I can use the buzzword, these are the millennials. These are the students that by the time you use the second word in a lecture session, they've already looked it up uh, on their smart device in front of them, and they already know what you're talking about. Mm. And uh, they are very clear in the kind of world that they would prefer to have as the world of work. And they're quite critical of many of the current opportunities that there are. So I think as employers and as educationalists, we have to look at it from both angles, the supply and the demand. Mm. Indeed. Well, it is. Uh, times are changing, no doubt. And Bright, I want to come to you. Maybe you were in varsity back in the days where tablets weren't available on hand <laughs> and smartphones weren't uh, a common item. But uh, your expectations, are you finding that there is uh, this, this shortage or this lack of cohesiveness between the reality of what the job entails and the expectation from a student's perspective? I mean, sure. They, I mean, there they is. Uh, if I speak from from an employer's perspective, um, they, there's a set of attributes you're looking in a candidate, and we have to be probably honest that education alone is not going to give you that. You know, so you can have a degree. Uh, a, a good employee is probably uh, uh, 
contribution of several factors. So you're going to have the qualification, naturally, you know, that's a, a, a criteria we're looking for. Mm -hmm. You're going to have experience if it's, a, it's not an entry-level position, but obviously the attitude of the individual is going to make a huge difference in, in terms of where they end up. And education, or, or if I take WITS as, as an education institution, is not going to give somebody all of that. And we have to accept that different players in the market have a role to play. And you, if you look in the context of South Africa, then you have the added dimension of transformation. That has its own um, uh, 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 you know, intrigues that bring into the employment uh, uh, scenario. If I look, for example, when we advertise for positions, mm. we have had to go three, th you know, four rounds of shortlisting. Because uh, there are many things you're looking for, and you can't find that in the CVs that are in front of you. That's the reality of the. But there are many people out there without jobs. And you will get applications, but it's not what you're looking for. So you go over and over again. The attitude, the qualification, and you also mentioned an important word there, skills, which I think is something that we take for granted from time to time. But Tess, I'm sure you can also add your voice uh, with regard to this uh, particular area that we're not getting what we're looking for. Right. Uh, we hear it from Bright's perspective. What is uh, lacking in the candidates? What, what, where are they falling short? You know, I, I like to say that soft skills are important, but I need to almost just go back one step and emphasize again that for me the real problem is the fact that there are still not enough degreed individuals and I really want to emphasize that because people want to um, publish and talk about advice for people in terms of looking for jobs and the soft skills that they need. If you do not have the hard competency that's required, that's really urgently required in South Africa, then no amount of being an awesome team player mm. and you know having a great attitude is going to get you there. So mm. the soft skills take you further they make your first job perhaps a success story they perhaps help you to do better in the interview but at the end of the day the entry level is going to in many many cases in terms of what our marketplace is demanding is about the hard competencies in the degree and then when we speak about the soft skills what is also really important in the changing work environment and i'm perhaps not as sympathetic to the um, generational theorists um, as much as I understand it's a very big reality that young people entering the workforce have got a different approach and have a different need. At the same time, there's a problem with entitlement. Mm. And there's a problem with um, not understanding that as much as people have a need to develop fast and they're impatient, the reality is that what employers are looking for is someone who can be trusted to get the job done and have enough of a, be ambitious, but have a realistic expectation about what an organization can do. And I do think organizations are doing a lot to be great employers. But at the same time, the demands of people coming in are often quite unrealistic. How do you manage those demands then from a recruitment perspective? It, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> in other words, saying a lot of <laughs> no's? Think, uh, no, I think it, it, it is about um, you know, giving perspective. And obviously, we as recruitment experts are able to hopefully give perspective often to the young people entering the marketplace. And perhaps we play a role in terms of advising and sort of educating about expectations. And I think that is certainly something that we do. And maybe that also needs to be translated into the lecture halls where they receive this information and uh, uh, get that theoretical foundation in order for them to move into the workplace. Prof, from your perspective, is this something that's changing? Yes, uh, I, I think the, the, the sort of definitions that one can give to hard and soft management skills um, can entail lots of things. Mm. Uh, I, I would say that where today the emphasis is very much on the financial competencies, no business school or university can give somebody a degree uh, uh, with finance competency that isn't uh, adequate to go out there and go and do a proper job in the financial field of expertise. That's just a given. But, but that seems to me as more or less the entry level of where it all starts. Because to progress within an organization's management ranks and career paths that one can go, the so-called soft skills increasingly mm. become definitive. And by soft skills, I would add not just let's hug the bunnies. Or How do you <laughs> ensure that a very competent financial manager is also a strategic thinker? Now that sounds fuzzy business school speak. Mm. I think it's absolutely 
And if I read the documents that we've looked at, it was talking about the, uh, the, the other management skills that are so critically needed by employers. As a, the financial skill is a given. It's just, if it's not there, then don't even apply. Exactly. But Brad, maybe this also brings us back to you because uh, reading through your bio, you mentioned that you're happy to have worked under SABS and the restructuring program, which is maybe walks back to the soft skills, you know, the strategic thinking here that you don't necessarily get when you are studying. But from a recruiter's perspective as well, is this something that you find isn't developed in some of the, the individuals coming through? Well, certainly, and, and I think sometimes we probably have too many expectations of the candidates, you know, in terms of people walking in. Um, and we have to process, it's not, we shouldn't use the word crisis, you know, em employability What's, what's the word we should use? Maybe no, 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 no. okay, take away this capital C. It's a big C. word. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, let's stick with the big word. But the big word is also as a result of unemployment. Mm. When, when unemployment is high, employers are spoiled for choice. So you begin to demand higher requirements for candidates, you know even in terms of experience, because I know the market is flooded with people looking for jobs. Mm. So a degree isn't enough. I'm looking for more than that, because if I say a degree, you know, the whole, um, she gave the statistics. So because of unemployment, we begin to demand higher requirements, you know, in terms of experience and all of that. But what we see also is that if I take in the management accounting space, you know, two years ago we decided to become a SEMA training partner for the reasons that post-2008 our operating environment has changed significantly, you know. And I, I would think that may Prof will correct me that the curriculum doesn't change as often, mm. Mm. you know, as fast as what business is doing. And we realize we're going to have to impart some of these skills ourselves internally, you know, rather than trying to go to the market and, and, and looking for candidates. So we have begun to do that. But if you took, you were talking about restructuring, it's not every day that you restructure. So you, you're obviously not going to find people that are readily available with the skills. What we have done internally, especially with the SEMA training program, which something I think is, is very um, uh, useful is that we find that as people study and you give them the opportunity to acquire the practical experience, they become better can, uh, you know, employees than when they go through theory without practice. The practical. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Prof, you agree quite strongly uh, when uh, Bright made mention of the fact that maybe academic uh, 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 criteria in the syllabus isn't changing as fast as what businesses' needs are. Is that something that's changing and is it something that as Wits Business School you, you've been looking at? Well, I'm not speaking on behalf of its business school in terms of its actual own strategy but yes uh, i can just simply confirm there's a huge awareness and not just awareness there are there's a great deal of energy being put into aligning curricula with the changes that's happening so at such an incredible pace uh, around us yes since 2008 uh, for instance this critical question how come that the smartest financial minds in the world, who were the senior executives uh, at some of the biggest banks in the world, were exactly the place where the meltdown happened. Mm. Theoretically, that should not have been the case. They should, be, should have been precisely the people who saw the tsunami coming. Now, those who ha are of a different persuasion are actually saying, no, they actually caused the tsunami. Mm. No, I'm not sp expressing an opinion about this at all. There's murmurings in the audience. <laughs> all I'm saying that is when you s uh, business schools start producing people competent for this changing business reality, have to look at a whole new skill set that has to be integrated with the standard well-known areas of competence, finance and marketing and uh, people management. But there's a, there's a whole different world that needs to be understood. And, and if I now want to be m mischievous, um, Thomas Piketty's book, that is, the whole world is uh, wanting to know what this Frenchman is saying. Is this a new form of Marxism when he talks about capital in the 21st century? But he's talking about new economic models 
And we have to talk about new business models. We need to talk about new education models. And this is not going to happen fast for precisely mm -hmm. the reason that academia isn't the one that is n naturally the fastest moving. It's just the nature of the animal. Mm. You also mentioned something quite poignant, uh, the policing maybe of the system. Somebody out there to hold people accountable. Yes. And Tess, to come to you, are we, are we seeing more of that uh, taking place? Because we know South Africa's got a very well, well-renowned yes. and respectable banking uh, industry and financial services industry. So the respect and the confidence is there. Yes, exactly. I mean, we've heard it said now often that the South African financial services system generally when compared with, with what happened internationally is actually in a very good space. And, but with that, we see just linking back to the whole thing of what are the, um, the attributes and the range of abilities and skills that these financial, anyone filling a financial role needs. That's where we see um, the increase in the need for an understanding of a regulatory environment, which has increased a lot since 2008. Mm -hmm. The need for the understanding of compliance. There's the ethical aspect of it, which now also comes in. And then, and then obviously the only constant is change going forward. So this is also a really important um, ability to be able to have the big picture awareness that you can be able to begin to think strategically and make a contribution strategically. So I really concur with, with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bright, just to come to you for a moment here, yeah, I want us to, to touch on uh, what corporates are doing as well, the post-skills development, because it's all good to have an undergrad who comes into the system and learns, but what about the individual who is in that position at the moment? Are they growing? Are they developing? What kind of skills are still needed? And are they, in improving their skills, studying the right courses? In, in fact, that's probably one of the biggest challenges um, from, our, from our own perspective, uh, you know, in practice, what we have found is that degree holders as opposed to professional qualification holders mm -hmm. because of the absence of CBT uh, requirements tend to fall back when the individual has no initiative. So, you know, when, when they don't take the initiative to improve themselves. And frankly, you know, in today's market, I don't think there's one qualification that claim can claim to give you everything. Mm. Okay, the reality is you want to have to have more than one. Okay, because that's the reality in the market. But also, uh, you know, the development that comes afterwards. If I look into our spaces, you can have your, you know, I don't know, first class. It's not going to make a difference unless you can impact the business, and that's where the issue comes in. We have seen the ability to influence. If you can't get to people, so your interpersonal skills have to be really good. Uh, the one I like the most is, is I think, the trade of the CMAS uh, management accounting principles, communicating with impact. If you look five, six years ago, a clever uh, management accountant has to create a spreadsheet, make sure, you know, at like any given time you can populate from the numbers quite quickly and email it to everybody who needs to use it. That doesn't help anymore. The, the, the best person in, in the market today is the one who influences the business uh, so that when they report the numbers at the end of the day, they should be where they should be. Mm. Not because you're reporting numbers that have been generated by an ERP system. That's not good enough. Okay. Not and this is where um, even I say the qualification will not help you. You know, the individual has your CPD that SIMA uh, and all the other professional organizations prescribe kicks in. Individuals' initiatives kicks in. In our case, for example, we have taken good people, you know, the, the ones that we see that are really good, and throw them into big projects. Because projects, these are complex projects, they don't come every day. And it's your reward, you gain experience that you would never gain anywhere else. Hmm. So for those who are listening, step away from the PowerPoint presentation because that's where not to do it. So that's not where you need to be quite clearly. Well, uh, before we continue with the panel discussion, we want to cross to the floor now to check if uh, any of our audience members have questions. If you do, please stand up and uh, introduce yourself, your name, your title, and where you're from. And uh, we'll take three questions from the floor directly. There's a roving mic which will make its way to you. Anyone with a question? Lots of smiles. No questions for the moment, but maybe uh, we'll, we'll come back and let them uh, simmer on it for a little bit longer. But uh, we're heading into a short ad break. More on skills development when we return.
Welcome back to SEMA Dialogues, where we are discussing talent management and the employability crisis. Now, still with me in studio is uh, Professor Anton Ruud from Vitz Business School, Tess Marshall from Network Recruitment, and Bright Amisi from SABS. Well, I want to pick up on a point that Bright had mentioned just uh, before the ad break, that maybe you need to step away from the PowerPoint presentation and set realistic expectations as to what is attainable for a chartered management accountant. But Tess, from your perspective, you deal a lot with corporates. Uh, are there any particular processes that they've installed in partnership with you mm -hmm. to not only retain the talent but also boost the post-grad uh, uh, qualification? Well, I think the, the reality is that there is a lot of initiatives in a lot of companies, but there is also in other, you know, this is how you find out where the staff turnover is coming from companies mm -hmm. because the number one stated need, and this is just from a range of surveys and research that professionals have, is continuous development. So the, the companies that are rising to the occasion and understanding that there needs to be flexibility with their accounting roles in terms of exposure to the different projects, as we've mentioned, in terms of actually allowing um, those key financial people to get exposure while keeping their, their grasp on the full financial function, while getting exposure to the different business units, especially the big concern is can they, this is also where they get a little bit tried and tested mm. in terms of their abilities to communicate across the disciplines and across the, all the different business units. So what I can really say about it is the companies that are more successful at retaining their key financial talents are taking a more proactive approach with allowing this kind of um, you know, across the board development for these people. And sometimes we also hear that often the reason for leaving and looking for other employment is I need more exposure, I've been doing one thing for too long. That is the kind of thing that does come up. So the key thing is that it's working? It is working in many places, but I do still think there's room for improvement. When you say improvement, in what sense? In the sense that um, companies need to articulate and more formally and deliberately look at what is my talent management strategy now specifically with this pool of financial talent that I have in this company to retain these people but at the same time in the best interest of my business going forward how can I make sure that these people are equipped to really make a contribution to this business strategically to the bottom line in terms of looking at future scenarios and if those people are not getting that exposure within the business it might be a short-term convenience for the employer mm. because sometimes it's a case of just let them sit there and do their job but when looking at uh, development, you do need to take a long-term approach with that uh, pool of talents. And the issue is, do companies actually understand that they need to articulate and formalize that process? It can't be ad hoc and informal. Mm -hmm. Tess, to pick up on your point, you mentioned that businesses need to be quite open and precise and uh, straightforward as to how they want uh, their, their, their employees to grow or these candidates to grow. But Prof, to come to you, are we finding that the candidates themselves, when they pursue postgraduate qualifications, are just as concise as to what the expectations are to get out of uh, the course that they might be studying? Well, yes, indeed. And they, they're quite vociferous about that, uh, and quite rightly so. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Uh, Business schools, universities, um, and just have to deliver the goods because I mean it's, uh, it's just people just vote with their feet. Mm. Uh, they they they'll just go where they believe they're getting uh, the return on their investment in terms and it and 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 higher education is massively expensive. But I wonder whether it wouldn't be useful to just make this observation of just how profoundly uh, th the very notion of what and how does one teach best at a university or business school? Uh, now, you know, management is, uh, loves these funny words. We create words, and then they become part of the management vocabulary. Like crisis, huh? Yeah, well, we like crisis. <laughs> but the one that's now sort of surfacing is MOOCs. MOOCs. Massive, open, online courses. Ah. Some of the top universities in the world, and I've just, last night, as an insomniac, I do a lot, can do a lot of re readings in the night. Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I, I would argue, is probably one of the best universities this planet has. They've just uh, released a report on how they are changing their curriculum and the way they teach. 
and they have a lot of MOOCs now becoming available, which means I can enroll here from Johannesburg for a course in management accounting or strategic finance at MIT, where I don't have to set foot on the Massachusetts campus. It's all on a digital platform. The first thing that comes to mind here is from an employer's perspective, is, is this what we want? Are they going to be gaining any kind of skills uh, through that? Absolutely, because can I, can I give you what MIT says? Go ahead. On, in, a, in this report of this. Increasingly, employers are focusing on certifying an employee's or potential employer or employee's competencies rather than relying on his or her formal degree. Right, your response to that? Because maybe this is where you come in to say, hey, you know, we read through those CVs month on month. Look, the, 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 the MOOCs concept has been around for some time now, yeah. and it's not going away. I, I think we have to embrace it. Uh, just as digital learning platforms are here, you know, so that's that's going to stay. But I think um, a lot is going to depend on what we do after after formal education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, in the workspace. And, and I think that's where the difference uh, really lies. In the South African context, there's a particular uh, challenge. You know, we we see candidates that have very impressive CVs, you know, big titles, but they empty. You know, uh, it means the 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 individual had a title, but the job content wasn't where it ought to be. Mm. And that's a result, you know, partly because of transformation. And uh, with that, you know, apart from uh, that gap that's created is that that talent, that perceived talent, prizes itself out of the market because they tend then to move to seek opportunities. And when you look at them, you say, you know, I'm not going to <laughs> upset the pay scales, mm. you know, to bring these uh, individuals. So you go for options. And that's a, a market problem. I, I think everybody will have to look at that and say, what do we do with it? Well, maybe we can find a solution here today while, uh, <laughs> by, uh, by unpacking these insights. But that's interesting you mentioned that, that you get someone in this position not doing much, but with a fancy title and a heavy paycheck. And that also impacts on the expectations. Because when you go back to those who are uh, starting out in the industry and perhaps want to grow even further, Tess, as you mentioned, they walk in with heavy expectations, very high expectations. Sure. And I think um, it's actually quite an unfortunate turn of events in, in, in your career if you land up in a role like that, where you have been you know, possibly prematurely promoted into a title, where in reality you're not actually getting the full scope of the range of duties that goes with that title, and it sets you up for a challenging walk forward because now your salary expectations, as you say, are on par with that, and at some point um, it turns then into a a negative experience mm. because the employer is feeling disappointed with your ability to deliver and you are feeling disappointed because in a sense you might even feel you've been set up for failure perhaps without even really knowing that that's what you've been leading towards and you know this is where employers and recruiters and everyone need to actually again play that that discerning and an advisory role and I think quite simply you can't appoint someone on job title mm. There needs to be the right type of competency-based interviewing and checks done to understand, don't be deceived just by a job title. I think that's actually quite, Im quite important to understand what is the real skill set of this person. And strike a balance between productivity and the reward. Yes. But Bright, you touched on into something quite interesting, uh, uh, the legislative policies that we have around transformation. Are we finding that legislature, maybe state intervention, is actually assisting in uh, 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 curbing this unemployability crisis that we have, so, crisis prof, crisis, I used it again unfortunately, this issue that we have uh, within uh, Chartered Management Accountants in SA. Look, it's unintended consequences of good intentions. Um, uh, and you know, we can have a whole day argument around this. Uh, I don't think there's a space for transformation. Uh, it's, it's how employers react when they feel regulated, you know, is to cheat the system. But the, 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 the Downside is you're paying the cost already, you're carrying the cost of the individual and you're not allowing them to do what you expect them to do. And then they begin to chase the market and you know try to look for everything else. So, well, I'm, I'm sure at some point we'll go for a review of the legislative uh, framework. There's a lot of discussion in the market around that. But I think it's, it's, it's employment practices 
and also its individual's expectations. Uh, Tess mentioned the, the, the expectation of entitlement, you know, mm. I, I, it's, it, it's mine and I ought to have this. You've got to do a whole lot of things to, you know, to get there. You, you can't say having watched someone for six months, you say I'm experienced because I was there for six months. Exactly. It takes time. You've got to invest uh, 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 a lot of time into it. And I think that's where the problem is. Even when you look at pe people's CVs, she'll probably confirm that. You see the length of stay in one job, you know, how people move from the one job to the next, to the next, to the next. They can argue, you know, the circumstances around it. But, you know, I, I think most employers look very down upon that, you know, when, when you see people that are job hopping, you say, ah, nah, I'm not going for this. Because it's very expensive to recruit. You go in, in the market to find a manager, right? You have to go through a three months process of onboarding them into the organization. Mm -hmm. Then I must show them the ropes. In fact, what is important to me is not what they learn in class, mm. is whether they understand our business or not. You're investing in them? Yes, okay. And when I thought they do understand now, they understand the business before they have even worked their living. I don't need that, you know. So, and, and most employers will take the same attitude towards candidates. Are candidates aware of this, Anton? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, when you, at a certain age of your life, you're getting maybe your second degree, you have high career expectations, you want to move fast, you want to get to the place that you think you are qualified to be, and that kind of impatience uh, is, is perhaps just goes with that particular phase of one's life but from an employer point of view obviously it's uh, when you start getting into systemic job hopping i mean there's th this, this nobody wins out of that because mm -hmm. there's and i don't think there's any disagreement that uh, knowledge is acquired in two ways it's it's experiential and there is the knowledge sources that like formal training and whatever but uh, I can just imagine the frustration for an employer that's invested. If you really have to calculate the cost to the company, it's enormous. And you've just made that investment and yeah, you go off to the next better uh, job offer, mainly financial. Uh, th th that, that just solves no nothing. But I just wonder whether what the view of the, the, the experts in the, in, in the field of, of, of the kind of skill set for financial managers. Looking at this report, I mean, this report is talking about a global crisis. Mm. And I know the focus here is and should be South Africa, but we're not talking about something that's just uniquely, so we have our own very unique features, I think that you've highlighted, but at the same time, we're also looking at a global trend of this mismatch. And maybe so that's what the support right point, very yeah. clearly says. Because as you know, everyone's well aware that so often we find uh, extremely well qualified individuals who go abroad to seek better opportunities. But Tess, from your perspective, are we seeing that uh, South Africa is able and its corporates here are able to retain that talent? Or are perhaps some of our best, you know, the, the cream of the crop being poached mm -hmm. by uh, top international companies? I, th I think I can confidently say that if we can call it the brain drain that was very topical about mm. 10 years ago, it has actually declined a little bit. We sort of regularly survey quite a, quite a large number of our financial candidates and over the last few years that we've surveyed it, I'd say about a third of them are seriously considering either working overseas or emigrating. So it's still a theme and it's still, it's still a factor. And in actual fact, um, and I'm sure this has been discussed often, I mean, I think people are aware of this, the financial um, South African people in finance are quite, they're quite well appreciated. Uh, so say it with overseas. feeling, yes, Tess. Say it with <laughs> meaning. Some of them are sitting here today and they want to feel as though they are appreciated. So they can, you know, go and globetrot for a while. Hopefully they come back. But it is, it is definitely a factor. I don't think in um, the finance space that we are in as much trouble as, for example, maybe in the engineering space and in some other spaces, to be honest. Um, but yes, uh, we, we, do, we do lose a percentage of our, of our good finance talent to the overseas markets. Mm -hmm. And it's increasing because globalization is increasing. So now when recruitment companies are searching for possible candidates, there are no more borders. Exactly, exactly. That, that's a very big trend that's, that's going to be on the increase now as well.
Right, you've got a smile on your face, so somebody's done something right to keep you in SA, but uh, from SABS's uh, perspective, your, your, your management retention skills uh, and techniques, are those working for you? Yeah, no, I think they are working, partly by, I think for several factors. Uh, in many instances, we are the industry, you know, uh, in our space, okay. So we probably one of a kind. Um, our competition is global, you know, in, in terms of we have local competition, but there's smaller players than we are. So in the, in that sense, probably we have that attractiveness. Um, I'm not talking about finance. I'm talking about the other side of, of our management. But in finance, then, you know, they, it's borderless, like she's, she's saying. But I think there are many things you can do in your own space to, to retain people. At the heart of it is that people will want to feel appreciated. You should be adding value to the life of the individual mm. beyond the salary. And that's what we have been trying to do. At the same time, extracting value from the individual. But what we're trying to say is with, with our people is that you got to move with the times because business is becoming complex. If you look, um, um, IT was not an issue to worry about um, many years ago for, for, for many CFO. You didn't even need to know that. You, you just need to know um, a bit of understanding. If, if you look at JEC listed companies today, King3 requires IT governance uh, to be part of the things you look after. And that role gets shifted to the CFO. Mm. So likewise, the CFO has to make sure that within the team there, <laughs> there is talent that can look after that. And so because of these changes in the, in the operating environment, what we see is structural unemployment. It means you, if you have limited set of skills, you're not going to fit roles that are becoming increasingly broad in, in terms of expectations. And maybe that brings us back to Anton's point, that is a MOOC the right way to go uh, when you want to develop these skills, these increased uh, uh, responsibilities that you might gain in the workplace. Uh, are we seeing MOOCs more developing now as competition for business schools or not well, at all? I think uh, all business schools are aware that there is this migration to increasing towards things digital. I mean, we just live in a digital universe, uh, so to speak. So it's, it's happening all over the place. Uh, I think some are more concerned than others. Uh, my personal view is that the contact uh, dynamics are not just simply going to go away. Mm. That there's still something to be said for that direct interaction uh, in, 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 in a learning environment. Uh, so uh, I think MOOCs in some ways are over-promoted and it's this big threat and it's this big solution that's going to solve everything. I don't think it is. Uh, quite frankly, it's going to be one of the tools that we have, one of the methods that we have, but I don't think it's going to become the tool and the only tool. There are some who would like to believe that, but uh, I'm not one of them. Mm -hmm. Well, we have certainly painted a very interesting picture mm -hmm. of a chartered management accountants from entitlement to MOOCs and even the word crisis. Mm -hmm. But let's go to the floor now where we have a few questions from our audience members. Again, to the audience, please stand up, introduce yourself and uh, state your question to our panelists. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Chris Hogan from uh, SEMA. Uh, and it, it's a very interesting conversation, by the way. Um, I just wondered whether the, the, the panel thought that there was an opportunity for broadening the pool of talent that you recruit from. We'll pick up on that one. Thank you so much, Chris, for your question. Uh, anyone else with a question? Uh, you can raise your hand and the mic will come to you in a moment or two. Maybe let's address Chris's question first, uh, Tess, and let's start off with you, <laughs> as the prof has indicated. Uh, broadening the pool the, with regard to what we're looking for in the criteria? I do believe that there is an opportunity for that, but I think the reality is that it's probably, I, I would imagine that it's maybe a generation away in the sense that when we look at financial, the, the, the finance profession, it remains a profession. And when the entry level or the qualifying factor for you to become a financial profession becomes too broad, or perhaps the, the access is too wide, and it's always a difficult thing to say because you don't want to imply the lowering of standards, that that would automatically happen. Mm. But the challenge is to find the balance where access is increased to perhaps different channels of, of candidates coming through in all kinds of different ways. And I mean, there are many things going on in South Africa, I think like that with the CETAs and things like that. But the fact is the uh, finance profession, you've also got to understand what our employers 
looking for that they, they in a sense higher in their in their own image and they value the qualifications that have been in a sense traditionally accepted and regarded so absolutely there needs to be that type of innovation and that type of openness to widen that but the fact is it's not going to happen overnight because there is a strong emphasis on these are the accepted and established routes to become a financial professional. Mm. I'm not too sure if you echo those same uh, sentiments, right? No, no, I do. And, and I think one of the things that maybe the education institutions need to think about is industrial attachment. Is it helpful that somebody will go through three years of theory without exposure to practice? You know, and they come out of the institution green. Mm. And when they walk out, then they realize the world is very cruel. You know. So um, it's, it's probably something we have to think about, especially from an education. Uh, personally, I have a bias for people that work and study at the same mm. time. They tend to produce better results because they, they tend to integrate practice and theory. And even when you talk to them, you can see they're well grounded in terms of their knowledge. Mm. And the training time is very short. You know, you expose them to your business and before you know it, they're running. Exactly. Well, Chris, hopefully that does uh, answer your question uh, with regard to increasing the talent pool there. But we have another question from the floor. Please stand up and introduce yourself, Mayor. Hi, my name is Dineshi Pillay. I'm a leadership speaker and trainer myself. I was interested in the comment that was made that there are not enough degreed people in terms of the employment space. My question is, what type of degrees are you looking for specifically in terms of employers? And is there any difference as to where you obtain those degrees in terms of the institution? Thank you so much Thank for your you. question, Jessica. I, I could think I have one small answer for your uh, last part, <laughs> and may definitely don't go to a MOOC, <laughs> uh, judging by your uh, end on uh, uh, perception of them. But Tess, let's start off with you. You made the comment earlier that unfortunately sure. a lot of people aren't studying further in, in SA. Well, I think there's different reasons why they're not studying further. But I think um, just to refer to a report that was released by the government in May, which listed the, and whether it was a perfect report and whether it reflected the public sector or the private sector, I can't tell you exactly. But it showed the top 20 skills most in demand in South Africa. And in that top 20 is um, engineers of all kinds and then accountants and financial managers. So degrees are not all equal. That's actually what we're also facing in South Africa. Um, South Africa was rated by the World Economic Forum second last in maths and science education. Mm. And this, we, I don't think we've touched on that yet today, but that is a very big factor. So what kind of degrees are in demand? A degree is a degree and it can get you far in certain respects, but in terms of if we look at it very specifically to guarantee your employability and what the market is demanding, it would be great if you can do maths and science and if you could do a degree in accounting, a BCom with an accounting major, do a SEMA, you know, up to degree level, get a BSc engineering or a mechanical engineering degree. Those are first prize in terms of guaranteeing a great career for yourself. I want to interject there because sure. it sounds like such a great opportunity for, for anyone who is a student uh, in a tertiary institution to, to study all of those courses. Absolutely. But isn't the problem in the foundation phase? How they pass their matric, how they make it to the matric, and what they're learning when they're in primary school. Right, so this is why this, we have another crisis, mm. sorry, <laughs> which, which really is, is in education. And going forward, we, we need to understand where the South African economy is also going, because this demand that we've already mentioned for these particular types of degrees, South Africa is moving more and more away from an industrialized economy mm. into a service economy. So the, the type of skills that are now being demanded are becoming actually more and more high skilled. And where we've got masses of low skilled unemployed people, our economy is exactly going in the opposite direction. So uh, a huge emphasis needs to be put on maths and science foundation phase, you know, and there are things that one could discuss that could maybe mm -hmm. solutions from, from the government and from private sector towards exactly. that. To come back to Dinesh's other question, where to study? Prof, I take it you have the answer with regard to this one. And Bright, maybe no, you can I, add your insights. I'm not going to go into the <laughs> sort of uh, pecking order. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make a broad observation uh, that I think most people who may spend some of their time in, in, in teaching in, in academic institutions 
a bright student will do well no matter where he studies or she studies. Sure. Well, on that note. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 it's it, but but that doesn't solve the issue. You're talking mm, perhaps purely statistically. You're talking about a small percentage. Mm. Of course, it matters. Mm. Uh, 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 academic institutions become th they have brand value like uh, any other organisation, mm. and some of them are very good at uh, churning out engineers. MIT is the place where you go, and Stanford are the places in the United States if you want to do engineering. Uh, that's arguably the places where you But I think it's not an easy ranking order. That, uh, there are various real benchmarks that you pass rates, uh, a number of students, how long do they stay, how many of them complete within the prescribed number of years the, uh, the, the course that they've enrolled for. So there are benchmarks, and there are top performers and middle performers and mm. poor performers. Brian, while well we do have one more question on the floor, I understand um, uh, if you can please stand up and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Leanne MacArthur Grill and I look after recruitment at Accenture. So my question is to the academic in the panel. Um, we That's all three, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all three of you. So we've gone some way to try and improve a bit of those employability skills by offering them pro bono to students. Mm. So we see the gap. There's a disconnect between skills, education, and jobs. So we've tried to assist in closing the gap. But we find that there's a bit of a reticence with some institutions to allow this to happen, because educators are worried about throughput, getting them the degree and getting them off campus. You know, what is your view on, on the openness across the industry when it comes to higher institution, to allow uh, corporates to partner with you in that way? I have my personal views about this, um, uh, which is not exactly what I think I'm going to unpack here. Feel free, but Paul. academic institutions are perhaps rightfully so. They, they, they're extremely um, alert to their brand value of exactly what it is that, uh, that they've built up over the years and why they have that brand value. And, and partnerships do happen. Uh, but it, uh, it, it tends to be who wants the brand more uh, in the partnership. Is it more important for the non-academic institution to partner with, the, with an academic institution or the other way around? And that causes tension. For, and some institutions will say, you come and do the program here, then it is institution A's program. It's not uh, institution A+. plus. Perhaps the Americans, I think, seem to have uh, a bit more of a different approach where you have the sponsored uh, p programs and persons and institutions' names are attached to it. We seem to have less of that in South Africa, and quite frankly, I think there's space to have much more of this because I think this could also contribute to having a, a, a richer input from the real world of work plus the academia. Mm -hmm. uh, academic institution. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a win-win solution. I could, I, I, yeah. But at the moment, it's a bit win-lose. <laughs> win-lose. Leanne, thank you so much for your question from the floor. But Bright, I want to hear your perspective from uh, the corporate side of things. Is it something that could be a win-win solution, as you heard? And are there ways maybe of doing it where an institution which deals very strongly in financial uh, uh, management courses ties up with another maybe financial player in the country? But then maybe that's the trick with chartered management accountants because they across the scope. Yeah, let, let me give you two examples that we have in our own. We are a CIMA training partner, and wh why we went for that route, you know, apart from, of course, the content of the syllabus, and our own experiences with CIMA is that as, as the students study, we will rotate them, you know, job rotation. So we move them around the system to mirror um, uh, the theory they're getting with the practical experience. Naturally, we will sign them off for their own membership requirements when they complete, so, so they see value in that. So that we do specifically for finance uh, professionals. When you look at the management layer, you know, you, you know, across the organization, we have the Harvard Leadership Program mm -hmm. for um, our management layer. Uh, of course, Prof said, uh, you know, it's online. Yes, it's online. <laughs> but the, the assignments are company specific. Mm. So you do assignments that are related to your business unit. Mm. And we pick modules from the entire program that are specific to where our business is in the cycle. So we're developing the skills that we need uh, 
uh, from the management layer because some of our uh, managers are scientists, you know, by training. So if, if I talk to them business case, they don't understand that stuff. We got to take <laughs> them through that. You know. I is mean, uh, no disrespect, but uh, it's just the background. Is this helping from a retention perspective? It does. It does. Uh, quite a lot it does. But people will leave. Mm. And you should encourage attrition of some kind. I, I don't think, you know, you should you should worry when one or two people leave the organization. It's a normal thing. People come and go. But it shouldn't be at a level where it becomes a crisis. Mm. Yes. We like that on that note. But uh, I want us to leave here having painted a very more, a much more optimistic picture mm. of uh, management accountants here in South Africa and maybe what people need to take away from this. And uh, Tess, maybe from your perspective, when you engage with candidates, we've already touched on the entitlement issue. Mm. Maybe they're studying the wrong thing with the wrong institution mm. and leaving the companies that they're with a bit too quickly. But those other ancillary elements, the soft skills that you touched on, uh, is that something that they need to focus on when they are uh, in liaise with yourself as a recru recruitment specialist and the corporate companies? Look, I believe that um, you know the the soft skill that's probably going to be the most critical one because your interpersonal skills are really important. Our employers often, when they're unhappy with someone in a financial role, the feedback we get is an inability to communicate really well. Mm -hmm. Going back to the PowerPoint presentation issue mm. and being able to engage with the different uh, parts of the business as a whole. So communication skills are really important. We're living in the digital age whereby, again, um, perhaps that those digital natives, as we call them, coming into the workplace often, surprisingly, cannot do business English. Mm. So there's an issue with, with, with communication in terms of just being able to articulate and communicate in a proper way Everything can't be handled on Mixit or What's on a SMS or on WhatsApp. Twitter. I've <laughs> seen interesting <laughs> things, but not everything can be handled that way. So that's also quite an interesting distinguishing factor, I think, for, for financial candidates is not just verbal communication, but actual the whole scope of communication skills. It's also quite important. And then this thing of learning agility, which is, I think, it, you know, it's been the thread running through everything. Having the degree is one thing, but Bright mentioned, you know, where's that bit of innovation coming from that person to be self-taught, to be inquisitive, to to want to learn more. Those are the people that will definitely rise to the top. Mm -hmm. Those people with that type of learning agility that they, and also can handle feedback. Can Whether it's positive people, or negative. Right. Can you handle feedback and then apply it? Exactly. Also an important soft skill. Thanks so much, Tess. Prof, your closing comments uh, uh, for potential candidates who might be listening today from an academic perspective? I think if we uh, just try and understand what we mean that we're living uh, in a knowledge economy, uh, that just simply says to me, amongst others, uh, learning is a lifelong uh, uh, must. There's no such thing of, I've got a degree, I've got a second degree. It's going to be a lifelong learning experience because that is just what a knowledge economy is going to uh, demand. It is cross and multidisciplinary. The skill set in a functional area of, of, of expertise is a must. That's, uh, that is uh, necessary, but it's insufficient. Uh, the managers uh, that you need for the corporation of today has to be a multidisciplinary, must be literate in the various disciplines. You just have to understand what that is all about and your capacity to integrate this in an integrated understanding of what the organization is and what management is. So just functional expertise by itself, not good enough. Mm -hmm. So communication, innovation, and no Absolutely. doubt multidisciplinary skills. Right, if you could go back into uh, your lecture hall a few years back uh, when you initially set out <laughs> on this course, did you know those three things? And uh, if you could do things think differently, what would they be? No, look, I was, I was green when, when, <laughs> I, when I started. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think the, the one thing that made a difference in my own life is, is how my employer um, you know, created the path for me that I could follow um, you know, with guidance, mentoring, which means you know, I could you know, make decisions around certain things. But I think uh, things have changed since then. You know, wh when I started SEMA, that what, 13 years ago, that's, things have changed quite a lot. And I think the business has become more open and global, you know, so, so the skill set keeps on changing. 
And I think individual initiative is probably going to make the huge difference. Of course, the employer gives the environment that is conducive for you to experience certain things. Mm. If people tell you, I have experience, it means somebody else took a risk because at some point you didn't have the experience. And probably this is where the employers needs to come in. At some point, you've got to believe in certain individuals and take risks mm. with them and say, you know, I know you, you, you haven't done this before, mm. but I'm going to back you up. Okay, but the individual then has to take the drive and run with it. And I think that's where the, 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 the issues are going to become. If you look in the South African context, we, we can't talk about closing the skills gap without talking about the majority of the population because that's where the numbers are going to come from. Mm -hmm. And this is where employers are going to have to think carefully, what do we do with that? You, we were talking about the universities. Mm. You know, and it's a real thing. It's a perception. It's a... It's a stereotype, but there's a reality attached to that. That you know, and even the candidates themselves, because they know of this uh, market perception, you can see that their confidence levels are quite low. Mm -hmm. You know, they approach the market as very timid uh, candidates, which is not good for development. So work on confidence yeah. as well. Well, uh, thank you so much to my panelists. That's all we have time for, though, for this episode of CIMA Dialogues. Again, thanks to our guests, Anton Ruud from Wits Business School, Tess Marshall from Re Network Recruitment, and Bright Amisi from SABS. And, of course, many thanks to our audience members who joined us today and shared some of their insights with us. That's where we do leave it for today. But I just want to confirm one thing with you. There is no crisis. <laughs> and on that note, uh, from myself, Kukule Tumfupia, and the team, it's goodbye for now.